we're going into our sixth season. Alan bought the place in the beginning of 2011, and I joined uh, in August of 2011. You know, when we first started the farm, it was mostly just me and Bobcat. We'd have volunteers here and there. We couldn't afford to pay anyone. We couldn't afford to pay ourselves. You know, we're working like 70 hours a week. It still is a really good partnership from the beginning. Um, you know, Alan's very business oriented and I'm a people person, so, you know, he does a lot of the office stuff and planning and I do a lot of the day-to-day -day dealing with the crew and stuff, so, I mean, it's worked out great. Um, here we are, five years later. Main Street Farms was started in uh, 2011 with my partner Alan Gandelman and myself. Alan and I met uh, in college, SUNY New Paltz in Hudson Valley. Uh, we both played hockey and really like music and um, so, you know, we were friends all through our college. Before farming I was a uh, high school social studies teacher and I was just really into food and the food system and I would see what the students were eating every day for lunch and it kind of upset me. So that's really what got me into thinking about changing careers and going into farming is kind of growing food in a sustainable way and feeding our you know community that we lived in. When I started farming the first year I kind of took this uh, class um, in Ithaca from the Groundswell Center where it was like a sustainable farming certificate program. It was like a year long program basically where I learned on other farms mm -hmm. um, and so that's how I learned about farming that and YouTube and a lot of research online. One of the barriers to becoming a farmer and being a new farmer is always land access. You know getting getting farmland if you didn't grow up on a farm and have land in your family. Well the original farm was just going to be aquaponic so I just needed some small a small piece of land and <clears throat> The place in Homer was a flower nursery that was not in use anymore, so that's how I found it. Actually, a friend of mine just told me about it, and I went to go look at it, and I was like, oh, this would be perfect. Um, so it kind of just fell in my lap, actually. You know, aquaponics, what is it, right? It's, you know, it's a combination of the, the fish system, which is practicing recirculating aquaculture. I guess that's why we don't use hardly any water. Um, with uh, hydroponic production, of, which is, you know, plants, okay? In, in a fish system, you're feeding, and of course any animal only absorbs a s small fraction of the nutrients in the feed, and so those, those nutrients are available, okay? And so the beauty is then you can take those non-used nutrients uh, provided by the fish and use that to provide the nutrients for the plants. So it becomes a, you know, a very symbiotic system and much more efficient. So we're taking something that would normally be a waste product in the fish waste and converting it into uh, a benefic something beneficial, uh, being the fertilizer. And not only that, the plants are working with the bacteria to remove the harmful stuff out of the water, filtering that stuff out, and it's gravity fed. So this water, this, the top bed is pitched to the back, there's a pipe down there. This one's pitched to the front, and then you can see this pipe right here, and the water drains back down uh, into the system. Plants are just really tough. Molds and aphids and just on and on and on and slight nutritional imbalances, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but, but again, coming back kind of full circle, the aquaponics seems to, to, to minimize a lot of those problems. And it's, it's, probably, it's probably something to do with biological availability of the micro and the macronutrients. Because we're not running close at all to ideal conditions on the aquaponic side, and yet the plants do just as well. It's amazing. One, certainly in Ithaca, and I, I think throughout New York State there's a real interest in eating local, and this is a way of producing things locally that maybe would have come from California or South America or before, because really aquaponic systems, when they're done right, can produce almost anything. Um, so I think it increases the ability to eat locally. Marketing to the local community, to restaurants, to the local farmers market, um, that was pretty much it. We didn't really know what we were doing at all. We were just kind of going out there and going for it. 
the aquaponic system, because it was so unique, it ended up being one of the biggest ones in New York State. Uh, we got just a lot of attention from our neighbors, a lot of attention from newspapers, and just the community, and the farming community, and so that's kind of how we made a name for ourselves. Um, people would want to come for tours and learn about aquaponics, we were going into schools and doing demonstrations, and a lot of that was the not only the aquaponics, but the location. We were right in the village of Homer, so we had really easy access to everyone. You know, people didn't have to drive 40 minutes to find us. And then as we got everything up and running and we were selling everything we could grow, then we kind of realized, okay, we should really start thinking about expanding and looking at um, making the farm a little bit bigger and um, reaching more markets and, you know, making more money. It was, it was really small. And to us at the time, we thought it was really big. I'm not convinced that aquaponic production is really sustainable. But within certain contexts, and depending on what you're trying to conserve, it could be a really good option for food production. So if we're going to have to have our strawberries in the winter, if we're going to have to have our lettuce or other things that wouldn't normally grow here in the winter, then it's a good alternative perhaps to other food production strategies. Um, it cannot financially sustain itself if it was growing like calories for people who needed food. That is not... At this point, it's just not possible. It's too expensive, um, which is part of the reason we're getting into more field farming because you know one of our goals is to make food more accessible. And if we're just growing high-value crops, we're doing that's really the opposite. You know, it was great. We did such a good job getting into restaurants and selling them lettuce, right? But then they were like, oh, we want tomatoes and we want potatoes and we want carrots, and those are things we can't or wouldn't grow in the aquaponic system. So we're like, all right, let's start on little outside garden, let's grow tomatoes in the greenhouse, and that's kind of how we kept expanding was we got into these markets with a very reliable, consistent product that people want all the time, salad mix, and then realized there is a demand for that, but there's a demand for everything. He has an advantage over other people who aren't doing aquaponics because he has the all year round production. So the customer has to make a choice. And this, you know, his customer, right? Well, I'm gonna, am I going to buy product from Alan all year round, or am I going to buy product from someone who only has product six months of the year or four months of the year? So that kind of gives us a little bit of an advantage, especially when we show up to market and we're the only ones with greens. People, you know, are really drawn to greens in the off times of year, so when we're able to pick up a lot of customers. So that's kind of what has driven the expansion, having that comfort in the back of our minds, knowing like, oh, we're not just going to grow all this stuff, and then what are we going to do? Basically, it's all pretty much sold before we even grow it, whether that's through the farmer's market or the CSA, you know, where no people want that food one way or the other. After the first year, I think, some of our farmer's market customers were saying, hey, you should have a CSA. So we're like, all right, we'll try out having a CSA, and we did. That first year, we had like 12 shares, you know, and we really liked doing it. Um, CSA stands for Community Supported Agriculture, and people buy a share in the farm, and then every week from June through November, they get a box of fresh vegetables. And at the regional market, right, you kind of get a mix. People who grow their own stuff and people who don't. So I tried to figure out who was growing their own stuff these guys I knew were, um, I found myself, you know, checking out their table and liking what they had every week, so I would just keep coming back, keep coming back, and this year I signed up for their, uh, their CSA. For five, I noticed their produce, that it's very fresh and honestly grown, you know, free of chemicals, just like they claim, and actually they didn't have to say anything to me, because just by looking at it, I could tell that it's really fresh and just pure. When people come to the market and they ask us questions, I can answer every single question they have, you know, looking them straight in the eye, giving them an honest answer. No, it's the, it's the best way to make my product. It's actually buying it directly from farmers because I know what I'm using. I, I, that's the best part is knowing who you're buying from and being able to talk to them about, you know, what they're growing, how they're growing it. I mean, they have great ideas for, you know, what to do with, with all of their their products as well, so that's really great. So being really diversified has helped us, and now having a lot of space to expand on, 
you know, we can really look at our markets, we can really look at our CSA, and we can say, which parts do we like doing the best? What's the most fun? What's the most profitable? What do we want to grow? And now we have those options, uh, which is really amazing. It adds a whole other element when I can kind of like step away from the, the physical aspect of farming or, you know, the, the, the brain part of, of managing the farm crew and just like be with kids that's just, you know, I just feel like I'm in my element, I'm very childlike, so. So part of the goal originally was to have more of a nonprofit education side and have a lot more programming and get paid for that, or at least paid part-time. Um, that's slowly been increasing. Bobcat's probably educated every fourth, fifth, and sixth grader at this point in Cortland County about aquaponics and local food, you know, been into numerous classrooms, I've done a lot of stuff with every college and driving distance, whether it's you know teaching or being on panels or having field trips. It's funny because I just had to go eat a school lunch for a newspaper story on Wednesday with parents and students and uh, a nutritionist and a reporter. And that was the first time I ate a school lunch since I was a teacher, so it's probably been like seven or eight years. And uh, it was the same exact lunch that the kids were eating eight years ago. But all of the food, none of it is being cooked. So there's really no cooking happening at all in the cafeteria. It's all just being reheated and then served. And two out of three of the kids at the table I was eating at didn't touch their food. They basically didn't eat. Um, and they said they would just eat when they got home. Well, I always joke around that we're brainwashing kids into eating healthy, you know, there's worse things in the world. but. Um... I think it's important uh, not only to grow our food, but to to grow the local consumer base. You know, so many people are used to the habits of going to grocery stores, and they don't even think about things like farmers markets and CSAs. You know, it's kind of like with farming, where you can plant something, but you don't really see the results until you know eight months later, and you just have to kind of be patient. Um, it's the same with the education side of it. You know, you're just kind of planting those seeds in those kids' uh, minds, and even in the teachers' minds of how they're teaching, and it just takes a long time for, you know, that knowledge and that those habits to come to fruition. Definitely. So I think that, you know, the main thing is having the fresh ingredients, and that's what tastes good. You know, not having reheated, frozen stuff, um, and having fresh ingredients and having the kids used to eating the fresh vegetables because you can't just like throw a fresh vegetable in there randomly because they'll have no taste for it. Things happen, you know, bad stuff happens, we lose, you know, plants or greenhouses to weather or just, you know, stuff doesn't work out in farming and we're just keep going. It was um, really good just knowing that we felt like so many people had our back, so many people were rooting for us, and we've had a lot of help along the way from some really great people in the community, and I think that was really, really helpful. You know, at the end of the day, what really matters is that the people who are eating the food are really happy, and they like it, and the quality is good. Um, they have some great stuff. I love their uh, colored heirloom carrots. They have the best ginger on the face of the planet. I always think about how my, you know, my parents always used to say, when are you going to cut your hair and get a real job? Uh, but they, they are very proud now that uh, you know, we have a successful farm. But I think, to me, the day that we start sending food down to the city and my parents can you know, eat the fruits of my labor, I think that would be, you know, pretty, that'd be pretty good for me. I'd, uh, then I'd say, okay, we've done enough. We don't have to expand anymore. <laughs> you know, we're doing what we love, so I think... Uh, when, when you do what you love, it doesn't actually feel like work.